Hi, welcome everyone. Um, this is our first Black in Motion event, uh, Race Accessibility and Online Learning. My name is Mira Govindasamy, and along with Dr. Cheryl Thompson, I'm a co-director of SMACT, also known as the Studio for Media Activism and Critical Thought. I'm really excited to get started with today's event and to hear from our speakers. Uh, but first, I just want to let everyone know that there is closed captioning available for you to turn on. So it's not just going to, it won't just appear, you'll have to turn that on. Uh, so at the bottom of your screen, there should be an option that says, uh, it, it'll say either subtitle settings or view full transcript or show subtitle. Um, and you can click those and play around with them. Show subtitle will uh, just appear at the bottom of your screen. View full transcript will let you see uh, basically the conversation as it happens, and you can go back and see uh, the conversation that's happened before as well. Um, I also wanted to say that, unfortunately, despite our best efforts, we were not able to find ASL interpreters for today's events. That's something that we were really hoping to provide, uh, you know, given the event's theme. Uh, so I apologize to anyone whose experience will be affected by this. We're really, we're really sorry that that didn't work out today. Um, a little bit more about SMACT. Since 2014, SMACT has been dedicated to blurring the boundaries between media, art making, activism, and scholarly investigation. Our team includes a working group composed of talented and dedicated graduate students, faculty, uh, and staff at Ryerson. We also have two of the most incredible research assistants. Uh, Jed Nabwengu and Imani Busby. Uh, this event was also supported in a very big way by three undergraduate students, Adele, Mir, and Imani again. This event would really not have been possible without their hard work and insights. Uh, we're also greatly appreciative of the Catalyst at FCAD for including us in this second annual iteration of Black History Month. Uh, and we hope that this is a partnership that can continue. This is, we had a great time organizing this event. Um, and before I pass things off to Cheryl to introduce our other speakers, I just wanted to say a few words uh, about the land that many of us are located on and uh, our relationship to it. So I personally live very close to Ryerson. So just like the university that this event is affiliated with, I'm located on the land of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and the Mississaugas. Uh, I'm a settler here. My father and his family are Tamil immigrants from South Africa and my mother's family are settlers here from the UK. This family legacy of settler colonialism has benefited me in many ways. Um, I'm honestly not always the biggest fan of land acknowledgements because I think sometimes they can be a way for settlers to kind of absolve themselves of guilt and move on with an event. But in a virtual setting, uh, I think sometimes we, uh, we kind of forget the role that the land plays in our lives and it's easy to forget where we are. Uh, particularly at Ryerson, we're kind of haunted by the statue of Egerton Ryerson. Um, Egerton Ryerson, for those who don't know, was uh, is who Ryerson University was named after and is also one of the founding architects of the residential school system in Canada. I personally hate the statue, but it also serves as a clear reminder that Ryerson is at its core a colonial institution. Ahead of a conversation about race, blackness, and online learning, remembering Ryerson's foundation in colonialism is a key to understanding how race is a factor in the institution's design to be intentionally accessible to some and not for others. Um, and finally, I just wanna share a link to the Native Women's Resource Center. Uh, so in addition to I guess making a verbal land acknowledgement today. If it's something that you have the capacity to do, uh, I would encourage folks to make a donation. Uh, this is a really wonderful organization and it's located really close to Ryerson. It's in the Ryerson community, I would say. Uh, and so if you are able to make a donation there as well, um, that would be great. I'm just looking for my chat box. Oh, there we go, I found it. Okay, so I'm pasting that in the chat. Yeah, and that's all for me. Uh, and so I'll pass things off to Dr. Cheryl Thompson. Take it away. 
again, how long have we been doing this? I should have known I was muted. Um, thank you so much, Amira, for that um, intro to this event. So I just want to say a few words about the theme. So tonight's event is race, accessibility, and online learning. And I just quickly want to plug our next event on Friday, which is the twin event to this one that is going to be about Black women in film behind the camera. So we decided when we were putting this together that we just felt that for Black History Month, we often spend a lot of time, you know, celebrating all the triumphs and the firsts and the and the this, but we don't really pay attention to people in, in especially in Black community who have disabilities, who have access issues, who have, um, who are, you know, online learning for those who are um, in the disability community is not new. <laughs> it's It's been around before COVID. And yet there is just isn't a lot of discussion about it. So we thought if we were going to do a Black history event, one of them had to focus on this issue of accessibility, of, of now also engaging with the online learning space that we're all in, and also thinking about how race is a component to all of that. And so to have that discussion, we have invited four amazing speakers who are just going to shed such unique and um, different perspectives on the topic. And so we're going to get this conversation started with, with Cyrus Marcus Ware. Cyrus is an assistant professor at the School of Arts at McMaster University. He is a Vanier scholar, visual artist, activist, curator, and educator. Cyrus uses painting illustration and performance to explore social justice frameworks and black activist culture. And he's shown widely in galleries and festivals across Canada. He is a core team member of the Black Lives Matter Toronto, a performance, a part of the Performance Disability Art Collective and an ABD PhD candidate at York University in the Faculty of Environmental Studies. His ongoing curatorial work includes That's So Gay, um, which showed at the Gladstone Hotel 2016 to 2020, and Blackness Yes, Blackorama. He is the co-editor of the best-selling book, Until We Are Free, Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada. That's also a 2020 publication. So without further ado, please welcome Cyrus Marcus Ware. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the chance uh, to join you today and the chance to speak with you. Uh, just to say, I'm coming to you from Takaranto, but from the part of Takaranto that was underwater at the time of the Toronto Purchase. So this is actually the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, this is the area that's covered by Treaty 13. This is Three Fires territory and territory of the District One Spoon Wampum. Um, I'm uh, really uh, excited to talk about this topic today because, of course, the entire world is going through a transformation right now. We're going through a profound uh, set of changes, a, a moment of revolutionary act, action and activity, um, and it's revolutionizing, uh, literally, how we engage with each other and how we connect with each other. And I agree, uh, you know, disabled, deaf and mad folks uh, have been grappling with these questions for some time. So we're uh, in this period, there's this theory in systems thinking uh, that's called the panarchy cycle. And it just sort of says that all systems go through a life cycle, a life cycle of growth and expansion, but also of collapse and reorganization. And we are in a period of collapse and reorganization. I think we all can see this right in our social world. Uh, the um, uh, you know, things are sort of rapidly changing uh, beneath our feet. Um, as the world uh, sort of wrestles not only with this pandemic, but also with uh, coming to terms with the widespread white supremacy, uh, the sort of deep-rooted systemic ableism that is rooted in our society that is being played out uh, at, uh, you know, on a large scale through the pandemic, um, that there is all of these change processes uh, that are taking place. Um, what we are in right now is sort of the mucky, uh, underbrush uh, after a forest fire where uh, the ground is nourished from the decayed matter of what has gone before it. But it is sort of a mucky, a hard place to be in. It's a fertile place though. It's a place where there is a possibility for growing and nurturing seeds uh, of future worlds. This is a, a photograph actually uh, from Australia. I spent January, 2020 in Australia and it was on fire. 
You know, it was literally uh, the entire continent was on fire. Um, and it was sort of a symbol, I think, of what 2020 was to become for a lot of us, this sort of higher fire, dumpster fire uh, of a year. Uh, but this is a photograph actually of February 2020. So immediately after the fires sort of went out, uh, we immediately see new growth, uh, new life growing from the ashes of the old. And that is what is happening in our social world, in our system that we're in right now, is that it is going through a period of collapse. And we are already seeing the, the new shoots of growth that our ancestors planted, you know, and that we've been planting for the last, you know, 500 years, but, but actively, you know, here, maybe we can say in the last 50 years, really actively planting some of these seeds that are now growing as shoots, just like these plants are here in Australia. So, uh, you know, everything is dramatically and rapidly changing. And we are living in this moment, in, the, in this current moment, in this Octavia Butler-like speculative future. You know, and she said in the book, uh, Parable of the Sower, the, the main character, Lorena Olamina, writes down things that she knows to be true in this book of truisms that she calls Earth Seed. And in, in it, she says the thing that she knows to be true, which is all that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. And she goes on later to say that we have to touch change, shape change. Uh, and she says that in the future, that's what everything will be like. And of course, if you look at what's happened in our world, uh, we are in a period of change and change and change and change. And so the ways that we come together uh, need to look vastly different than the ways that they uh, looked before. We've seen people turn uh, in the last 12 months, in the last 14 months, the last 16 months towards this idea of collective care, of mutual aid, of rooting our work in this idea that we can take care of each other, that we will uh, take care of each other, that we won't rely on the state to make sure that we are safe and secure, that we have all that we need, that we're going to take care of each other. And so this is exemplified from everything from you know, the man who the black man who's building the tiny shelters uh, all over the city of Tacaronto because the city can't seem to house its residents even during a pandemic, you know, to uh, you know, the the ways that people are are starting these mutual aid funds to support uh, you know, communities all across this north part of Turtle Island. We are uh, showing that we can take care of each other. And one of the things that we've been doing is that we've been reimagining uh, what pedagogy needs to look like. So uh, as people came together during the beginning of the pandemic, they saw an opportunity for learning and for pedagogy. And so what we started seeing was groups like the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project organizing weekly webinars on abolition, you know, that got people talking about defunding the police, that got people, you know, a mass group of people radically educated and expanded their consciousness around ideas of abolition, uh, of, of ending this sort of br brutality of policing. Um, as a way of, of teaching people uh, very, you know, this is a picture actually from the Black Panther Party from one of their free lunch programs. But again, this mutual aid project, we take care of each other. You know, we also meant we were going to educate each other. We were going to share information and share resources. And so learning, you know, started happening a lot more online and this created an access for a lot of deaf, disabled, and mad folks who otherwise wouldn't have necessarily been in these conversations because if they had been held in a venue in the community, uh, there would have been all sorts of reasons why uh, we would have been excluded or might not have ever been able to make it there for those of us who, who don't leave our homes for other reasons, right? You know, so, uh, you know, this is a possibility uh, right now where we're taking care of each other and, and doing things in a new way. Um, So we're moving into a period of uh, an abolitionist future. And um, something is ringing, so sorry, <laughs> I'll just, uh, uh, we're in moving into this period of this abolitionist future. And part of why we're able to move into a period of a future where we're redefining uh, safety and security, where we're redefining what care would look like, where we're redefining uh, how we're gonna take care of each other is because we were able to do this important work all through the early part of the pandemic 
to educate people in new ways, to learn online in new ways, to uh, come together in new ways, to think through how we wanted to shape our society. I went to uh, Instagram live chats, you know, I went to, you know, there was online education, there was like, uh, you know, uh, phone zap tutorials and all sorts of things, resources that people are creating uh, as ways of, um, of, of of teaching everybody so that we're all sort of on the same page as we move forward through systems change. So this idea um, of, of, of this moment that we're in being a revolutionary moment is, is, is very accurate. Revolution is not a one-time event, it's a process. It's a series of, of actions that continue. Tony Cape Mbera in the early 1980s said that in fact, the role of the artist uh, from a, an oppressed community is to make the revolution irresistible, is to do just that, to, to work to make the revolution so accessible, so desirable, so possible uh, that we can't help but get involved and get engaged. And I think that that's what we're seeing now is a lot of revolutionary pedagogy, you know, a lot of activists, you know, activist scholarship and people sort of reimagining uh, how we're going to, um, how we're going to build this world if we're in a period of collapse and rapid reorganization, if we're planting seeds for what's growing next, if we're trying to imagine into what kind of world we want to emerge from COVID, you know, uh, now is the time to start imagining what this irresistible revolution could look like. So if I have uh, just a moment more, I, I wanna quickly just show you uh, a project that I've been doing um, that it, attempts to do just this, uh, to make the revolution irresistible. Uh, I wrote a play uh, called Emmett, which uh, is sort of like a future archive. It was for this project called 21 Black Futures. And it's a screening on CBC Gem and it was made with Obsidian Theater, uh, working with director Tanisha Tate and Prince and Ponsa. But it uh, necessarily required me learning how to uh, do theater online. So I had to do a crash course, we all did, it, online learning about how we were going to produce this uh, artwork that would be displayed online, that would tell this story about a potential future. As Walida Imarisha says, all activism is speculative fiction because we're daring to dream that an another world is possible. So this is a speculative fiction work that dares to dream that another world is possible. It tells the story of Medgar, who lives on the edge of the Great Ontario Sea, a newly formed waterway, uh, on, on after years and years of viruses, on a where everything is the same, and we meet him on a day when everything changes. So I'll just play a quick clip, and then I'll end there. Thanks. It's been seven years exactly since the fall. I normally spend today remembering the past, honoring our dead, and marveling that I somehow survived. I do it alone, you know. It feels private somehow. I mean, I guess we do everything alone now. I like to light candles. I normally do the same things on this day as I remember, but this year, Everything is different. Today is not about the past. It's about the future. So that's just sort of a taste. This production is going to be airing for a year on CBC Gem, and you can watch it. But it was uh, my crash course in online, <laughs> online how we're going to do things as transition into an online world. And again, it's an opportunity for me to tell uh, a disabled future. So as we go through this period of systems change, of, of collapse, but yes, rapid reorganization and reimagining of our future worlds, we need to imagine uh, disabled futures. We need to be building worlds where there are disabled characters where are the, there are disabled people living long enough to become elders. You know, this is so essential as we start to plan and reorganize our, our society. Uh, the systems uh, change process that is underway is perhaps an inevitability, as Octavia Butler would have said, all that we touch right now, we change and all that we change, all change changes us. So as we go through this period of change, we need to keep and remember and hold on to centering disabled, deaf, and mad leadership, uh, and making sure that we all have what ne we need in order to survive and thrive into the futures. So I'll stop sharing my screen, and I look forward to hearing from everybody else. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
ah, uh, you just, you, you started us off on the right tip. Thank you so much for that. And I, I'm just thinking about activism is speculative fiction. I want that on a t-shirt, not for sale, but for myself, because I think that is so key. So thank you so much, Cyrus. So now I'm going to introduce Gloria C. Swain. Gloria is a multidisciplinary black mad artist, activist, and mental health advocate. Gloria works within the mediums of installation, painting, performance, and photography. Her work challenges and connects intergenerational traumas to ongoing colonial violence and mental health. She has shown in Toronto, Manitoba, and Montreal. Gloria holds a community arts certificate and master's degree in environmental science. Gloria, you have the floor. Oh, I thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm coming to you live from my little art space, my studio. Uh, I just want to like uh, quickly touch on how the pandemic is affecting me as an, an older artist, uh, the limitations. Um, first, I want to say that isolation uh, as an artist is really nothing that new because as an artist, I'm always alone creating. And as an older black person, I'm always alone, so I create. So I'm gonna to talk today about my art. Um, I've written some stuff down. Um, okay, so my art does not only reflect my journey with my own mental health as an aging black woman artist and activist, uh, but it also includes the issues of stigma, trauma, anti-black racism, generation of poverty, police violence against black bodies and cultural identity, which off, off, with others in the black community can relate to and learn from without feeling fear or judgment. Uh, I work with the mediums of installation, painting, performance, photography to challenge systemic oppression against black women and black trans folks. Uh, my earlier work uh, utilized mostly gray white and uh, black paints to capture the bleak narratives of oppression to which black bodies are often subjected to and narratives from which certain black bodies, especially black women and black trans folks uh, been, have been slightly excluded and overshadowed. And this is one of my earlier pieces. So, I use, I use black, white, and gray. This, this is old school, okay? So uh, black, white, and gray was my main colors. Um, I recently started experimenting with color. So uh, by injecting different, sh different shades of blue, uh, use a, in a rebellious act. Um, I wanted to just say with these, with my the, with the new work, I wanted to say that it's time for older black women and mothers, grandmothers, community leaders, elders, uh, and people who identify as women to be seen and to be celebrated. Uh, we've done the work, so now it's time to lift us up. Don't wait until we're dead and say, oh, rest in peace. No, it's not gonna work. We need to be acknowledged today, uh, number one, okay. Uh, I began to explore abstract paintings in the early 80s because I was attracted to its potential to uh, create contact messages. Abstract, it allowed me to put all the issues on one canvas, uh, issues that are necessary. And it was an opportunity for me to tell my own story. It's important as black people, black women, to tell our story. We don't need someone else to tell our story because they're gonna tell it the way they want it to be told. We need to be in control of our story. I know a lot of times when I speak about my um, work with mental, black mental health, I get a lot of people say, do I feel exposed? I say, no, I feel in control because I'm telling it, the story. I'm telling you what you need to hear. Um, I carefully use textures in different layers, such as fabric, tissue paper, uh, under acrylic paints to show that different stories overlap. In our community, we don't have one issue. We have a lot, we deal with a lot of stuff and we pack it, pack it, we pack it in. 
Um, so what I do, I use both shapes and colors to illustrate movement and resilience through a racist world and through unwelcome white spaces as an aging black woman artist with invisible disabilities. So what they don't see, they assume. So what I do, I layer it. Uh, here's, uh, here's another one. I hope you guys are enjoying my little display. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is just layered to illustrate the invisible disabilities that you can't see. They're there, you just can't see them. And I purposely use black, white, and gray. White represents the resilience, the residue of um, colonization, that, which still impacts the black community. The black color represents the black pain that we still carry inside of us. Even though we're strong, we're moving on, it's still inside of us. And the gray is the oppression that still exists in a lot of the, a lot uh, in the black community. Uh, born in the 1950s, I started drawing and writing at the age of 12 as a form of expression and a COPA mechanism. Um, I have been creating art for over 30 years or over 50 years if you include my childhood. Uh, growing up in the southern part of the United States, we weren't allowed to talk about mental health. We were told to keep it in the family. You don't tell the community. So that's where a lot of the stigma comes from where we don't talk about it. And so through my art, I'm able to talk about it. I'm able to get other people to talk about what they're going through. So I think that's, um, I'm happy to see that a lot of young people today are talking about their mental health. We didn't, we didn't see that when I was growing up. Um, art plays an important role in visualizing accessible future for education. Uh, is a way of healing, a way of connecting. And I believe that art is important in allowing children, yes, we have to start at a young age, allowing children to express themselves freely and build self-esteem. Uh, I remember how art, uh, how important it was to me growing up. It's like, I couldn't talk about it, but I could create art. And that was a feeling that gave me, uh, uh, that make me feel good about myself. So, and that brings me to um, exhibition that I just closed. It's, it focused on the cuts to education, the government cuts. So I do workshops for young marginalized children and I photograph them doing the artwork. I never photograph their face. I, I photograph their hands creating the art because looking, uh, there's still a lot of stigma. And so art is a way to remove the stigma and address the issue. Uh, in my experience as a black university student with mental health issues, as a mature black university student, I struggled through almost four years uh, with anxiety, stress, depression, and there was no support. So being a student and experiencing that on top of the issues of trying to learn, the issues of trying to find the funding, the money to complete your education, what would have helped me during that time would have been a therapist who looked like me, a therapist who could relate to what I was going through, uh, talking to a, a white person about black mental health, it's like a, it's a, like a step back. Um, and what also would have helped me would have been a therapist who paid attention, eye contact, look at me when you're talking to me. If you come to me, you have issues that you're going through. If I'm taking notes and not giving you that attention, you're going to like close up. So that's, uh, uh, that attention is very important when it comes to like black trauma. Um, in the space, the space was not, the, the space has to be warm and welcoming. You walk into a room, the walls are white, there's no art, the furniture is white, and you feel like you're walking into an institution, you're walking into a clinic. So that basically threw me off. Not only did it throw me off, it threw off a lot of other young black women who were attending university. It was to the point where 
I was holding group sessions for young black women in the cafeteria. So that was, we created that community, that black mental health community that should have been in the schools already, but it wasn't. Um, and anyway, I think what also would have helped to have mentors who looked like you. My mentor was a 20 year old white girl. I'm 60. What are we going to talk about? So that was, uh, that's another thing. Representation is very important um, when it comes to black mental health and addressing black trauma. Um, and also I think it's important to be given options as far as being a student and dealing with mental health issues, have that option of, uh, okay, I don't feel like getting out of bed. I'm, my body's not getting up. My mind is overcrowded. Have online options for them, online learning. Give them that option to like, okay, stay home. Let's turn on the computer. Now, sometimes you can't get out of bed. It's not like you don't want to get out of bed. You can't get out of bed. Sometimes I spend a week in bed. I'm like, that's, that's okay. I'm good. So that would have been a great option. Um, and I just want to add on, I want to, because my work now has, as I got older, I'm getting older, knock on wood, uh, aging. Have, I think right now during this uh, time of pandemic, the isolation, the uncertainty, elders, seniors in our black community need support. They need to see other people. I'm just, I'm, I'm good that I can get up and go, but there are some seniors who don't have that option. Uh, disabilities, mental health issues. So my thing is I'm hoping that the black community can reach out to these elders um, knock on a door, you know, like uh, and no one use a phone anymore, so text them just to see how they're doing. Um, so what I wanted to say, I don't know how much time I got. I just love to talk. But anyway, um, we need to recognize and support older people who have contributed, contributed to our community, to social justice issues, and who hold untold stories. There's a saying that when an elder dies, you lose a library. Talk to them. Somebody come and talk to me. I got a story for you. So it's like, you don't block them off. Mental health, art, there's always that journey that we need to share, that we need to talk to somebody. Um, Sorry, closing. you are getting a bit on time. So, so okay, so I got one more word, one more to say. In closing, I just want to say, I hope that my art empowers others who look like me to reach out to people who look like you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I always like to take, I always like to take like the one thing that I feel like each speaker said that resonated with me. And it's when you said that telling your story, you did not feel exposed, you felt in control. Yes. I think that is so powerful. And hopefully we can get back to that in the Q&A because it is so key that people right. recognize that if you're going through something, chances are thousands of people are going through it. Yes, yes. So you're, you're really not alone, even though <laughs> you might feel like you're alone. Okay. So, so I love that. Thank you so much, Gloria. Our next speaker is Tamika Walker. Tamika, with a loud, charismatic personality and a big heart, has always wanted to be seen as resource for those living with disabilities in the Afro-Caribbean uh, community. Starting her journey in behavioral science and technology at George Brown College, Tamika de dedicated five plus years of working directly with child and youth diagnosed with autism on skill development across various settings such as group homes, schools, as well as IBI. I'm not sure about that acronym, so maybe you can explain what that means. Now, as an alumni of the Disability Studies Program at Ryerson, Tamika committed herself to changing the ableism that exists within her community. She has attended various events within the greater Toronto area surrounding disability and race, as well as contributed to a transnational disability studies course starting this coming year, 2021. Most recently, Tamika served as a committee member of the Anti-Black Racism Committee here at Ryerson University. Welcome, Tamika Walker. 
Hi. Okay, so I don't think I'll take too long because Cyrus and Gloria definitely covered most of what I wanted to talk about. But I wanted, there was something that Gloria said that kind of I had added note to what I was going to speak about was um, I wanted to highlight where I came from and then what made me go into disability studies. So kind of like how Cyrus was talking about planting the seeds, I wanted to talk about planting the seeds in our education. So what you guys, what everyone's learning when it comes to online learning. So as a first generation Canadian, I went, um, I come from a Caribbean household. So I come from a household where um, conversations surrounding disability and mental health is not talked about as Gloria mentioned, it's, it's in quiet. So one of my family members, he, he was diagnosed with a mental health um, diagnosis and our family couldn't talk about it. He, he went into university, went into college and was dealing with anxiety and all that, but we, we weren't able, no one knew how to address it because many, my parents, my family members came in, came to Canada with the belief so that they take from back home so that individuals with disabilities or mental health are incapable, undervalued. So whenever we had to address my family member with this, this mental health um, diagnosis, it was hard. It's almost like you put it under the rug and just hope it goes away or you pray about it as they would mention. So as he's not here to tell his story anymore, it was when we, I decided to get into disability studies and I went into disability studies hoping to learn more about my, my history and hoping that I could take it into my community. Um, and I want to say the program changed the lens of how I seen this, um, how I seen disability and those marginalized, but it didn't, most of the literature that we read and what we covered came from a non black disabled person or non, it came from, it was hard for me to get that sense of belonging in the, the course I, I kept looking like I remember doing a course um, about representation and disability and the most we talked about was black lives matter like these conversations that we're having right now, like this platform, it would have went a mile, like would have went lengths in our program if we ended up having this. Individuals, it would have opened doors. Like I, I would have told a friend, a friend would have told a friend, like join into this place to join because it they, they was just lack that part. It lacked the race. And I remember reading in one of the the articles that I, I was looking at, and I think it was um, Linda Brown who spoke about, you can't address disability, you can't talk about disability without addressing race. Like it's, it's you can't, you just can't. And because the, the history of ableism and racism are intertwined, codependent, they go together. So like, I remember looking for that so much in the course and um, that's what made me lead to like, talking about now disability studies and anti-racist work, they would, imp if working together, it would improve education so much. Like, it, I can't even stress enough how much um, it would improve. And especially during like our disability studies program, everyone's looking for a place that they can come and feel their full self. And as Gloria mentioned, like um, looking for mentors, even the ones who are teaching you the course, they, they didn't, it was hard to, to connect. So someone like myself, I, I did my homework. I, I went and read books. I went and looked up Desmond Cole. I, I came across a Cyrus, re, Cyrus readings and I came, I had to do my own homework to figure out how to navigate the course and still fulfill what I was looking for. So that's kind of what I wanted to like leave with. I didn't, I don't want to run on cause I trust me as Gloria, I can talk to, um, but I just wanted to kind of say that like it's, it, black disability studies and just experiences of black people which are often ignored in our um, in our black communities and disability studies is it definitely helps shape how disability studies programs is received by individuals like myself and I think if any as we are evolving now it's time to like kind of evolve that course so that's kind of all I wanted to say you know you 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 think you didn't speak for a long time but you said a lot in that short <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> program on blast you get the <laughs> on blast you you talked about all the gaps and the truth is that's what we need yeah. i said this in my class today you can't fix what you cannot see and you also can't fix what you won't even acknowledge right and i think so your words were important so thank you tamika so much for that our last but definitely not least we have taylor lindsay noel She's a 27 year old entrepreneur from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. 12 years ago, she was a Canadian national gymnast, but in 2008, under the coercion of her coach, she had a devastating accident that instantly paralyzed her from the neck down for life. 
Since then, Taylor has persevered through adversity and has received a BA in radio and television arts from Ryerson University. She is currently balancing a motivational, being a motivational speaker, podcast host, disability advocate, and owner of Cup of Tay, I want to say it is, Luxury Loose Tea, Luxury Loose Teas, which has just been featured on Oprah's favorite thing list for 2020. Please welcome Taylor Lindsay Noel. Hey everyone, um, I know that I'm gonna have definitely a little bit of overlapping, uh, but I guess my point of the contribution would be my life has been, uh, as you guys have heard, full of very many pivots. I at one point had aspirations when I was a child to be an Olympian and was very much so on track to do so. Um, and obviously I had a devastating fall that left me paralyzed. And in that moment, everything that I ever thought about being a gymnast, being an Olympian, being a sports doctor one day was completely taken away from me. I went from being the most able person, um, a highly able person, uh, being able to do any and everything I wanted to with my body to relying on someone to get me a glass of water. So obviously having all of that happen at 14 years old was very life-changing and very devastating. I was very fortunate to have an incredible support system and not only with my family, but also my friends and the community. At the time, the story was quite widely um, talked about in the media. But what I began to see and happen was I had been such an independent person. So as I had this physical change, I was able to take my gym days and put that into physiotherapy and focus. But what I lacked in those moments was the capacity to handle the mental side of it. And dealing with, as a teenager, we already know how much our bodies go through change and hormones and all of these things. But if you tack on the fact that you feel like a foreigner in your own body, which translate in so many ways, whether that be through, um, how you identify or either physical um, disabilities, it's quite the mind game. And also being of the Caribbean background, I got two crazy islands in me, I'm Jamaican and Trinidadian. Uh, that is not, like everyone has been saying, it's not something we talk about. So I found myself going through the spiral of dealing with mental health issues. And um, I guess I, call, I called myself a functioning depressed person because I didn't know how to identify. And uh, through the years, I was able to use um, my medium as poetry to get myself and save myself from myself. Uh, but I think it would have definitely gone a long way uh, if the conversations around mental health uh, were not stigmatized. It's crazy that we're still having to say that so loudly and proudly. And that's why with my company, we donate a portion of our proceeds to mental health awareness because it is something that is so incredibly important to me. But in navigating, and by, beyond that, in navigating the accessibility space, uh, I went to Ryerson and Ryerson is leaps and bounds ahead of so many other places. It was a big reason why I did go to Ryerson. But one of the first things I noticed when I got there was my building, the radio and television arts building, didn't have an accessible bathroom. The closest bathroom was in another building. And when everyone else can go and do whatever they wanted to do, I had to haul myself outside in the cold to go. And uh, having a very boisterous mother, she made that very known. And guess what they did? they created an entire bathroom. So now that accessible bathroom in the Ryerson building and the RTA building is because my mom is very loud. I'm saying this to say that sometimes we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I remember my mom bringing that up and saying she wanted to say something and be like, no, 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 it's okay. Like, I, it's fine, I'll just go outside. Um, and she made it a point to make sure that they knew that this was an issue. And advocacy is so important because the resources are there. There are millions and millions and millions of dollars. There are millions of resources, um, people who have what you need. And we have to be more comfortable advocating for 
ourselves. And if you can't advocate for yourself, finding someone who might be able to help you do so. Uh, like I said, I was very lucky to have a mother who uh, would not stop, but it has helped me to be able to do that now when I'm more comfortable in my daily life for other people. Um, beyond being Black, female, and disabled, which touches a whole lot of different realms, um, I found myself in rooms of opportunity, and I think it's really important that we continue to speak up for others when you are in that room of opportunity. It has helped me get to where I am today, and I know um, it will continue to help people beyond me. Lastly, um, I just wanted to thank everyone for the space and time to be able to share my story. Like uh, Cheryl had said, I now am, am a proud owner of Cup of Tea, Luxury Loose Leaf Teas, and we have organic teas and teaware, and it's kind of been my little baby that has very graciously been on Oprah's favorite things list this last few months. And um, while I can't talk about everything that's coming for the future, I'm going to just know that with the work that I'm doing, I'm continuing to advocate for mental health awareness and uh, the importance of representation. Because again, being black, female, and disabled, um, I enter a lot of rooms where people don't look like me. But when you don't see someone who looks like you in the rooms you wanna be in, sometimes you have to be okay with being the first. And I hope to um, continue through my example to break down glass ceilings and be an example so we don't have to in 10 years from now be like, I've never seen someone who looks like me because it's 2021 and it's kind of ridiculous that we still have to say that, but yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Ah, oh, Taylor, so many nuggets, <laughs> so many nuggets. But again, I think what I, the major thing I heard from you is definitely about advocacy. I think we don't talk about advocacy enough. If not you, someone, you know, and that's why silence is a violence because there's often times where people don't say anything where they can be your advocate, but they just don't want to get involved. I think the message I heard from you was get involved. And I want to say to you, thank you for that washroom. I had no idea as being someone who has worked in that RTA building for years, I had no idea how it got there. Yeah, it was, it was one of those things that uh, you don't see it unless it's your reality. That's and it right. very quickly became my reality. And uh, my mom and I were very quick to Make that a change so uh, I hope every time you guys use a washroom you're a little happy because <laughs> it's there it really is there thank you so much and so I want to thank all the speakers but before we get into the Q&A part in the discussion Mira just wanted to to make a little announcement about uh one of our forthcoming events so we don't forget Yes. Um, well, I'll make an announcement and then I'm going to do uh, a little interactive activity now right Cheryl before the Q&A okay so um, it's on April 13th. Uh, it's our third part to the speaker series for SMACT annual speaker series. It's the fifth installment of the Laboratory of Feminist Memory. Um, and so this is an event used to happen at Glad Day Bookshop, um, for those of you who know it. So it's a very casual, fun kind of cabaret style event, uh, often hosted by feminist comedians, drag queens, drag kings. Um, it's a really fun event. We're doing it online this year. Um, and the theme is uh, basically about the home as an archive because we're gonna be in people's homes in a really different way uh, through, through Zoom. So follow us on social media um, and you will hear more about that and be kept in tune when we have an event break going. Um, maybe Imani, could you post the, uh, social media channels in the in the chat and everyone can follow that and and if I could just quickly I, mm -hmm. I was so remiss everyone if you can can you unmute and give these four speakers some love tonight this evening because that was just an amazing I mean, come on. Yes. <laughs> okay. you know what I'm saying like that was that just gave me life yeah. And I'm sure it gave a lot of people life as well, and also a lot of takeaways. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and there Imani shared at Ryerson Studios, the Instagram and Twitter. Um, so you can follow that. But yeah, thank you to the speakers. That was, I think we had kind of a vision for this event, but it was not real until we 
heard what all of you had to say. And so uh, it was amazing how it, it all, yeah, it all just came together in a way that uh, was almost like you'd all planned it together behind our backs. <laughs> That's kind of how it felt in a good way. Um, so I'm gonna share a Mentimeter activity. And I thought I didn't know how to use Mentimeter. And then I, I think I learned how uh, somehow in this process. So we're gonna try this. Um, and essentially the way this works, if you've ever used Kahoot, it's very similar. So you can go to uh, www.menti.com and we'll be able to see live responses to this question. Uh, and then we have one more question as well. If this doesn't work, then I'll just have you share your answers in the chat, but I think I figured it out. And so this is our chance. We want the audience to interact with us. We know not everyone here is a student, but I think many of you are. Uh, so you can speak to the perspective of being someone in an educational role. I think many people are affiliated with Ryerson uh, in some way, uh, or lots of us have had different experiences of online learning, even in a professional development setting. So that counts too. Yeah, I'm gonna drop the code in the chat to make it easier. And do you have the question on Menti already? Um, yeah, can you see it on the shared screen? No, just on Menti, I don't see it. When you log in and put the code in, do you see it? Yeah, I just, no, it just asked me to submit. I don't, how do I, it's probably, you know what? <laughs> sorry, this is a senior moment. Maybe Gloria, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but maybe, maybe you understand. I'll do it on my own. Don't worry. I'm going to, uh, yeah. I have, sorry, very random voice on here uh, because I think I did the same thing you did. Did you go to mentimeter.com and not menti.com? Uh, yes. Amazing. Look at this. I don't even know who solved that problem, <laughs> but thank you. Okay, amazing. So we can see the answers popping up here. Um, hopefully this will also contribute to some of our discussion and Q&A later. Um, lack of captioning, getting information in advance, collaboration, unfair expectations of students without sufficient resources. Yeah, technology, I don't think we even, there's so much discussion today, but I think we maybe didn't get a chance to talk about access to technology, um, the impersonal nature of social interactions. Yeah, from a mental health perspective, I think that can be very true. Barriers to communicating needs much more uh, challenging to ask for help. Yeah, that's very true. Difficulty staying focused, personal boundaries, lack of motivation, expecting students to have lots of time. Yeah, I'm just gonna scroll through a bunch of these. Motivation keeps coming up. I really feel for the students on that one. Limited body language. Yeah, the quality of video and sound itself long screen time, the awkward pauses. <laughs> yeah, above all, it's just very awkward sometimes on Zoom. <laughs> Connections, wow. Connection issues in a technological sense and connection issues in a interpersonal sense. Or both, yeah, I guess it's both. both. Yeah. Yes, yes, all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> Oh, losing your job due to the pandemic and then having to work double this semester while feeling like school is double the work for sure. Yeah, financial stress, I think, has been very real for a lot of students. Losing internet. Um, managing work and family balance. Yeah, everyone's working in really different places. Is that better, Cheryl? You said it was too small. Yeah, I think that's better. Like I'm only seeing half your screen for some reason. Hmm. 
Are other people having that problem? Oh, okay. Sorry, you are. Better, yeah. Hmm. I, I see someone has placed long live lectures. Yes, Mira, now it's better. Okay, it's because it was off to the side on my screen. I didn't realize that would affect everyone's viewing experience because I'm trying to see you and, and this. Okay, connection issues. I mean, wow. a, lot of these, okay. a lot of these comments that you're leaving here are very real. And I think that the next maybe component to this, uh, the, these comments that you're leaving is really to think about how it is when we get back into the quote unquote in person, some of these challenges are actually just going to continue. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we think these challenges are just online, but the truth is that the physical classroom also came with its own accessibility challenges. So I yeah. think if I'm, if I'm leaning into what Cyrus was saying, I think it's kind of imagining a future where we address both. Can I, can I say something really quick to that? Okay. Absolutely. It would be amazing. I don't know who's in charge of these things, but one of the things I tried to bring up before I left was the fact that not all rooms are wheelchair accessible. So yeah, that would be great. Anyone who anyone who's hearing this, if you're hearing, <laughs> and you know, unfortunately, <laughs> they are still building those classrooms where you have to walk, like you you don't just enter the classroom. Like you have to enter, then go up a set of stairs to get to your seat. Yeah, I used to sit at the top of a classroom because there was stairs the whole time. So everyone was down and I was up. It was, it's a whole thing. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yes, we do. It's real. Uh, Mira, maybe do we want to go on to the yeah. next question? Yeah, yeah. But thank you for sharing that, Taylor. Okay, so the next question. I've got to move your faces around so I can see. <laughs> What elements of online learning do you hope are retained when in-person learning is possible again? So a, a forward-looking question and keep in mind the question, oh, I think voting is closed for some reason. Let me open it again. There we go. Um, yeah, keeping in mind the discussion that we've had today and uh, the relationship between online learning and race. Chat function. Yes, I love the chat. <laughs> that was me. I'm outing myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love the chat fact function. I'm hearing so many people yeah. saying that they're online and and they're not able to do the chat function. It is such a, a an amazing component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like a lot of accessibility has actually like come with a move to online learning. Um, like there are challenges, but I think it's been an incredible learning experience as well. So yeah, chat function, ability to rewatch lectures, recordings being made available after live sessions, more flexibility towards students' abilities to complete work given mental health disabilities for sure, checking in with students, even though some of your profs currently do this, routine recordings of lectures for review purposes, flexibility and engagement. Yeah, flexibility, I love it. I hope that we have the option to tune into lectures from home when we don't feel comfortable in person. Mm -hmm. I, I think the yeah. recordings, if I could just say all the comments about recordings, it's really interesting because I think the pandemic has moved the pedagogy going back to Cyrus in terms of allowing things to be accessed after class because there was a lot of pushback when before the pandemic that we would never record our lectures. We would never make any of that available. And I think people were thinking in terms of maybe um, um, plagiarism, not thinking about how it allows your classroom to be more accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see also asynchronous options here. A lot of students enjoy that. The drive to attain more accessible common education spaces. Yes. Extended access to therapy. Mm. As Gloria mentioned, the option of attending from home. Yep, for sure. Yeah, lots of stuff about the flexibility of this option. Yes, quieter ways of participating, yeah. thumbs up, clapping, emoji buttons. Absolutely. Why do we always demand that people have to speak in a class of 300 people? <laughs> it's actually really crazy to think that that was a standard. That should not be a standard. You know, you should allow for multiple ways for people to express themselves in the classroom. So I do hope that that also stays around for sure. 
I wanted to add, I don't know, I've seen a clip of it, but diverse speakers. Um, now that we've been online, we've been like connecting with individuals all around the world to play part and take part in our conversation. Like I got an opportunity to um, create a course for the disability studies program. And the prof I was working with lived in Jamaica and my prof set us up and we met on Zoom and stuff. So like having different um, individuals a part of the conversation has really, really something that I think would be really beneficial to online learning. Yeah, I mean, what are borders <laughs> now? I think we, we have completely reimagined the concept of space and distance. I like this comment about more therapy offered by the school. It's interesting. It's taken a pandemic to realize uh, the kind of mental health needs that students have. Uh, but I think those were probably there kind of all along. Um, what's this long one? That professors continue to maintain the daily impact mental health can have on you and your ability to complete coursework, not just big life events uh, you need to sub submit paperwork for. Yeah support for black and disabled faculty and students, faculty, anti-racism, anti-oppression work. Yep, I think I've seen lots more training happening and awareness, awareness of inequitable spaces outside of school and how that impacts ability to thrive at school. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for humoring me in this, uh, <laughs> this activity, everyone. Um, yeah, let's move to the q and I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah, does anyone, um, if you have a question that you would like to ask um, any of our speakers, you can put it in the chat or if you like to raise your hand or just speak openly. We just ask if you do speak, if you could share your video, if you wanna speak, but if you wanna put something in the chat, that's fine too. To folks who are asking about the responses, yes, we're gonna find a way to get everyone those responses from the mentee activity. Um, yeah, we're hoping to turn it into some kind of a document to share with you all. So I do see a question here, um, if I can ask, this is an open-ended question, if anyone would like to field this question, this is actually coming from the, the, the team <laughs> that put this whole event together. And it's a question of how can we all, artists and non-artists alike, work to make the revolution more irresistible? <laughs> what is social media's role in this, do you think? anyone who wants to field that question? Well, I mean, obviously I'm very interested in this idea that we could make the revolution irresistible. I think part of what we need to figure out is, okay, what is my positionality? Where am I in this world? What is my platform? What is my opportunity? What are the opportunities that I have to be that catalyst? You know, Do I have maybe access to a platform where I can share a message? Do I have access to institutional resources where I could potentially fund work that is already needing to happen in the community? You know, do I have, uh, you know, the ability to to offer training or education to, uh, you know, a new generation of, of revolutionaries or activists who are who are getting engaged? Like, what is the thing that I can do? And then do it really. I mean, at this point, that's where we're at is that we need action really is, uh, you know, the time for talk and discussion, the time for study and research. Uh, you know, we're in a moment now where it's like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> so uh, figure out what it is that you can offer. Uh, and we, we kind of need everybody, every warm body at this point, right? You know, we need everybody to be engaged and involved in, as Octavia Butler said, touching change, because we're trying to build a world where we all get to be free. It literally will be better for every living being on this planet, because it will also mean that we'll have solved climate change, we'll have solved a lot of these problems because we will be committed to black life being inherently valuable for example you know so we need to uh to all get involved to to shape this so figure out what it is that you have what's that thing that you can offer that's just uniquely you and then do it and then do it every single day yeah no thank you and i think um, just a follow up to that that just has come to me, um, Cyrus, you can feel this or anyone else. I mean, I think, you know, 
this is something that I've been thinking about too, is like, what is freedom? Because I think people have notions of freedom that to me, when I hear people talk about freedom, I'm like, well, that's not the freedom that, that I'm talking about. So what do you think freedom is in the 21st century? Like, is it the same concept of freedom that they had in the 20th century, in the 19th century? Is, is freedom this static thing that is always meaning the same things or does it actually mean something different today? Do you think to truly be free? Like, what does it mean to be a free individual in the 21st century? Because I don't think we know. <laughs> I don't think any of us really know. I think we can imagine freedom, but I know I can say to my, for myself, I don't feel like I've ever truly experienced freedom. Well, I love this. I'll just give a shout out to Dr. Naila Kalina May and her Black and Free project that she's doing that is trying to explore exactly this. That's what does right. it mean? You know, and back to that Nina Simone song, I wish I knew how it would feel to be free, you know, and this is this question for us in this moment. But I think that the freedom that we're looking for is radically different than any type of reformist strategy that may have been suggested earlier. I actually think our ancestors were also radical revolutionaries. They were trying to abolish slavery and we're trying to make sure that that process actually gets finished, you know, by abolishing the police and the prison system. So, you know, committing to this sort of radical act activism so that the world that we're birthing is accessible. You know, the world that we're birthing is, uh, you know, mad affirming, where mad people are celebrated for our beautiful, the ways that our minds work, you know, where we're birthing a world that doesn't have borders, where we're birthing a world where trans people get to live long, healthy lives and get to live to be elders and, and great grandparents, you know, and grandparents, where we're birthing a world where all of these things are possible uh, and that, and, and, and literally our wildest dreams are possible. <laughs> That's the kind of free I think that we're talking about, a free that is so deep, that, that is so knowing, that is so embodied. Um, I, I think that for me, that's why it's so irresistible to try to get there. Totally. Um, for me, I think, uh, okay, I'm, 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 I'm talking six decades of fighting. For me, freedom is being able to walk into any space and feel welcome. Uh, freedom is not having to march because another black body has been taken by police. Freedom is looking at people at the top who look like us, who think like us. Uh, freedom is the community supporting and lifting each other up. So for me, freedom is community, that strong community, that bond where we take, when I, when I, when I rise, you rise. To me, that's freedom. Mm. I feel like that's freedom we can all believe in. <laughs> At least I would like to. I see a question. Um, there's a question here. I'm just a question from Anna that I'm going to ask. So Anna's asking, while being um, black, while being on Black in Canada with Asha Tomlinson, Cyrus, you mentioned having a feeling of optimism toward activism and the BLL movement in Canada. Just curious to know six months later, if you feel as a society, we are taking steps in the right direction. Well, there's so much work to be done. And I think that the work needs to continue to, to happen, absolutely. But I mean, we are already starting to see people building abolitionist communities. You know, they're relying on, we're already starting to see them building transformative justice care models in the community. We're seeing people, you know, do mutual aid, uh, community care, collective support. We're seeing people building tiny shelters out in the, you know, in the cold to make sure that people have what they need. So people are starting to respond and say, we need to take care of each other. And how are we going to do this? And so I think we are starting to see uh, that the state is a white supremacist, anti-Black state. The work that we're doing uh, to tear down needs to be paired with uh, planting and building. And so we're also, you know, as we tear down, we're also planting and building the future that we're trying to get to. And so that's what I'm seeing people doing right now is this planting and building. And I think that you can see it in Gloria's artwork. You know, you can see it in Taylor's, uh, you know, motivational speaking and, 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 and sort of business work. You can see it in all of these different manifestations, the ways that people are sort of imagining a future that looks different than the one that we're in right now. What we need is, is 
the support to tear down the systems of white supremacy. You know, we need to toss those monuments into the river. And the time is done for that system of violence and control. Uh, and, you know, I, I wish, uh, as, as Nina Simone again says, too slow, you know, in Mississippi, goddammit, everything that is happening is happening at a snail's pace when we're in a life and death situation. So, uh, you know, it can't happen soon enough. We need to tear down these uh, monuments to white supremacy. We need to eradicate white supremacy that is dying in the wool here in Canada, and we need to build these other communities that we're trying to birth into being for our futures. Uh, so building these abolitionist communities and supporting each other, responding to conflict, crisis, and harm in new ways that are rooted in care. And I think that that's starting to happen, but I mean, hey, I my plug always is for anybody who's been sitting on the sidelines for the moment, who's been wondering, is this the moment that I should get involved? The answer is yes. Please come and join us. Please join us shoulder to shoulder in the struggle. Join us from your beds. Join us from your homes. We can do activism as disabled people from anywhere. You know, we've we can crip the way that we organize. But now is the time to get involved. You know, change is coming. Change is here. So we're just shaping it. So yeah, I'm still hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after all that. I mean, because you have to be. I mean, why would you do the work if you're not hopeful? I mean, there's no reason to get out of bed if you've lost hope, right? Um, so I appreciate that. Asada said that. Asada reminds us. She says we have to believe that we can win because if we, if we cannot believe that we can win, we're whipped before we start. She says, you know, she says we have to pay attention to what dangers exist and to look at those dangers coolly, uh, but 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 to believe that it is possible to topple these systems because we have toppled other ones before. That's right. That's right. You have to. And so thank you so much, Cyrus, for that. I see another question here um, that is open to the to all the panelists, of course. How do we move through the fear? experienced through the struggle? And this is a question coming in from Mir, who's one of our BHM students. How do we how do we do that? Because often I think what holds people back from doing anything is they're just, they're fearful. They're scared. And, and also they don't wanna, they don't wanna give up anything, right? They, they fear that if they do participate, then they're gonna lose something. And so that paralyzes them from doing anything. How do we how do we move through that in the struggle? Um, I'll maybe take part of this one. I think what we have to do is become more uncomfortable with. Wait, let me say this first, and this is going to sound wrong, but I'm going to get to the point. You have to be uncomfortable with failure. I think sometimes we have like this perception that like if we put ourselves out there that we're gonna get it right the first time. If we try to be an activist or join an organization that we're gonna do the work and get it right the first time. When the reality is oftentimes we're not and we have to be okay with that. And once you move through that uncomfortable position of not having to be perfect in order to start is when you really start to see people change. Like I apply that to like business. I had zero idea what I was doing. I had, had no family who was in business, no example. And I had to be comfortable knowing that there was a very high risk it was going to fail. And when I got over that like fear of, oh, okay, it's okay if I fail, then it allowed me to succeed. And I think if you apply that to so many different areas of your life, you'll really start to see the change. Like for instance, I had the opportunity also at the end of last year to join the PCEO, which is um, the Premier Council on Equality of Opportunity. My apologies, my mom is in the background completely ignoring the fact that I let her know that I was gonna be in a video chat. Um, Caribbean parents. But um, I got the opportunity to join the Premier Council on Equality of Opportunity. And when the option was presented to me, my first thought was, one, I'm busy, two, but are we gonna really do something? Is it just gonna be one of those other government things where they put a fancy title on it? And once I got myself out of that negative headspace of defeating the purpose before I even started and just allowed myself to join and start and see what we can do, um, we've been able to do great things and especially with the Black Youth Action Plan. So uh, get more comfortable with being uncomfortable and getting more comfortable with failure because we're not perfect and you're gonna get it wrong. 
the probably. And if you don't, amazing. That's a great first step. But if you do get it wrong, it's okay to try again. Or you know what, what I like to say is if you don't get it wrong at the start, just wait for it because it's coming. <laughs> it's just inevitable, right? Gloria, go ahead. I see you. I think for me, um, fear, fear, my passion over uh, comes, my, my passion is stronger than my fear. And my uh, uh, strength to like know that sometimes you have to like stand alone. You have to walk alone. Sometimes you're on your own. So you have to have that uh, uh, um, passion inside of you and forget about the fear. And just think of the good that you can do, not just for yourself, but for others, so. Yeah, kind of to second off of uh, Gloria, when it comes to your passion and your fear, I remember when I wrote my final paper for disability studies, it was focused on ableism in the Caribbean culture. And I went back home to Jamaica to get, to do the field work, to get some data. So I went back home and I remember seeing a sign that said like, uh, some sign that was inappropriate describing disabled um, individuals. And I went up to the manager and I asked, how come you guys have this sign? I knew at that moment they could A, throw me out of this place, B, they could get real nasty in here, but surprisingly, she was like, you know, I, I agree. And it opened a can of worms and it made it, and it, it felt like that fear I had was like, if I didn't try, if I didn't do it, I wouldn't know. Like, I, you've got to try, you know? So similar to what Gloria said, it, the passion, sometimes that passion overcomes the fear and you're like, you know what? I'll just see where this goes and, and let's, let's try it. For me, the fact that, uh, that we're in a panarchy cycle, that systems change happens, that the system goes through a life cycle and that's just what is happening, helps me to be less fearful because I know that change is, is, is for sure. You know, that as soon as, uh, that, that, that it will go through a period of collapse, it will go through a period of growth again too, but it'll go through a period of collapse and reorganization and growth and collapse and we're over and over again. So I know that it is going to change. And so I can be brave. You know, it allows me to be braver because I can believe that like, you know, this is an, and this is gonna happen whether I get involved or not. And I wanna help and make sure that this happens strong and full, yeah. No, thank you, thank you so much. And everyone here, we are at our time. It is unbelievable that it's funny because even though online events, I am finding like sometimes they go by like this, like this felt like five minutes to me. And usually when it feels like that, it means that we hit some magic here tonight. And I think we really did. I know I feel like I've learned, like I have some tools to go back into my life tomorrow on this virtual world and, and just think about things differently. Like I said, I'm, I keep hearing that word advocacy. I keep hearing the word being brave. I keep hearing the word, word, you know, passion and community. Gloria, you are all about the passion and the community. And I think often in this COVID time, yes, we're, we're all quote unquote in isolation, but that doesn't mean that we can't continue to be in community. So as we leave here this evening and wrap this, I hope that everyone what leaves with that, that you can create your own community no matter where you are and where you go. So I'd like to thank Cyrus, Taylor, um, Gloria, and Tamika for just being you and showing up tonight. And I think everyone here has left with something. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. As we mentioned at the start, we also have a second part to this event on Friday. Um, it's Black in Motion behind the camera, where it's going to be me in conversation with two Black women filmmakers who are also Canadian, who are going to share their stories of how they make their craft, both in and out of COVID. And so I hope you join us for that on Friday. Information about that, I think, is going into the chat. If not, um, we'll resend it out, I hope, to everyone who registered so you can think about coming. And if not, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And if I can just quickly say, um, as well, we'll be previewing more of the Little Book of Black Joy, which is created by myself, Adele, and Imani. Um, we'll talk about you know, our experience with that. Um, and yeah, it'll be good. So thank you everyone for coming and have a safe and enjoyable rest of your evening.